Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook, and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. This week marks the 200th edition of the Moneymakers Investment Trust podcast. And I've taken the opportunity as a result to take a short trip down memory lane with Simon Elliott, the former co-host of this podcast, with whom I shared the first 120 odd editions before he moved on to a new job and could no longer appear every week. So we talk about uh, what's happened to the investment trust sector since we began. He and I are joined also by Mark Dampier, the former head of research at Hargreaves Lansdowne, the UK's largest private investor platform who is a non-executive director of Invesco Select and also has been a director of other investment trusts as well. We look at the investment trust sector in the round and talk about some of the challenges that the sector faces, many of which we've covered a lot in the last couple of years, but also talk about what the real strengths of the sector are and how and when it will recover. So I hope you enjoy that conversation. In the markets, it was a case of more of the same pleas as the US and Japanese markets again performed well, reaching further new all-time highs. The Nikkei in Japan and NASDAQ in the US are both up around 2% on the week, while the S&P 500 was up a short 1%. The S&P 500 index has now risen in 16 of the past 18 weeks, one of the longest streaks for many years. NVIDIA, the poster child of this latest bull market, has seen its market capitalization double from $1 trillion to $2 trillion in just 180 trading days. Quite remarkable. Over here, the FTSE was down a tad, but there were promising signs of life in the 250 index, up 0.9%. In the gilts market, it was a turn of longer dated issues to see their prices move higher, while yields edged up in the opposite direction in the front end of the curve. Those who expected to see early interest rate cuts may be disappointed as the US economy remains strong and the latest inflation figures were not as good as some had hoped. All prices, gold and Bitcoin, which is proving to be the go-to risk on asset in this current market phase, all moved higher. Turning to investment trust, the investment trust index had a quiet week, finishing a small fraction of 1% down, although there were more gainers than losers when one looks at the detail. Some 40 trusts have hit new one-year highs, which is an encouraging development. Cordian Digital, ticker CORD, was the best performer, up some 9% on the week, while the Wooden Spoon this week went to Regional REIT, the specialist out-of-London office property company, who saw its shares come down 14%. Alternatives in the round were among the relatively poor performers this week. There were plenty of interim and annual results for investors to chew over, a number of large and well-known trusts among them. They included JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, ticker JGGI, Murray International, ticker MYI, Midwind, ticker MWY, Smithson, ticker SSON, European Opportunities, ticker EOT, Law Debenture, ticker LWDB, and Aberdeen UK Smaller Companies these being all equity trusts, while amongst alternatives we had results from Tritax Big Box, Greencate UK Wind, the Renewables Infrastructure Group and Bluefield Solar. It was encouraging to see that of these 18 trusts reporting results for the period to the end of December, every single one of them reported a positive NAV total return, although not everyone beat its benchmark. The best performer of all was uh, Smithson, which reported a NAV total return of 13.3% for the calendar year 2023, which was some 4% ahead of its benchmark, although the board attracted some criticism for deciding not to hold a continuation vote, despite the shares trading over the 12-month period at an average discount that was a fraction ahead of the 10% threshold at which a continuation vote can be called under the articles of that particular trust. Also in the news, we had an update from Aquila European Renewables, ticker AERI, 
which confirmed that he's now engaged in a due diligence process with several other parties, including Octopus Renewables Infrastructure, which you may recall made an approach to take over the trust's assets at the end of last year. Elsewhere, Digital 9 Infrastructure, which is uh, going out of business, alas, published a circular about its proposed wind-down, while shareholders in Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth, ticker ADIG, and Downing Strategic Microcap, also voted for resolutions that will eventually see both those two trusts wound up as well. Consolidation is continuing. A JP Morgan European Discovery, ticker JEDT, announced that it was changing its management team with the long-serving lead manager Francesco Conte stepping down after some 25 years and a new three-man team from elsewhere in the JP Morgan stable coming in its place. All these news items and plenty more you can read about in our usual weekly roundup on the Moneymakers website, together with our list of the week's biggest movers in share price, discount and NAV terms. This week's trust profile features Bankers Investment Trust, ticker BNKR, the global equity vehicle which has been managed by Alex Crook at Janus Henderson for many years and which traces its origins all the way back to the 19th century. You will also find some commentary on this week's news and the latest market developments in our new regular weekly email to subscribers. And I will be adding more names to my list of favourite funds in the course of the next week. So please do sign up to have a look at those if you're interested. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be able to uh, mark this 200th episode of the Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast by laying on what's going to be a very fascinating three-way conversation with my original co-host on the podcast, that's Simon Elliott, former head of research at Winterflood Securities, now a big panjandrum at JP Morgan Asset Management, and also with Mark Dampier, who many of you will know as the former head of research at Hargreaves Lansdowne, the UK's biggest investor platform and who is a non-executive director of some investment trusts and also has invested in investment trusts himself over his long career in the investment business. So we're going to be putting the investment trust sector under the spotlight. It seems a good moment at the 200th anniversary. We've been going now for something nearly four years now, though it's hard to believe. So I think it's worth starting, kicking off, if I may, by asking you, Simon, just to recall that day back on April the 6th, 2020, when we first did our podcast. I don't think any of us knew uh, quite what a roller coaster it was going to be, either in the very short term or indeed ever since. So uh, tell us what uh, you recall about that and what we've been living through. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say what a great honour to be part of the 200th podcast. I mean, it's a massive achievement. So congratulations to you. You've kept more than the ship afloat. I think it's gone from strength to strength, frankly. In preparation for this call, I did go back for my sins and I rooted out the original episode on the 6th of April, I think, 2020, and listened to it last night. And I've got to be honest, it wasn't entirely obvious on the strength of that first episode that you had a 200, hopefully 200 plus editions in you. I think we probably had some learning to do. But it was an absolutely fascinating time, to to your point. I mean, it was, as I mentioned, early April 2020. It was kind of two or three weeks into the whole kind of COVID lockdown period. Markets had been in free fall, although actually it's just started to recover, I think, by the time we recorded our first podcast together. But, you know, we had a huge amount to talk about. And again, not obvious at that stage how things would, would play out from that point in time. No, I think it's absolutely clear. Whatever we were capable of predicting at that point, it certainly wouldn't be what actually subsequently happened, uh, which was an extraordinary uh, recovery from the lows of that point after the first lockdown. We had that extraordinary period in 2021 when everything took off and went into the stratosphere. And then the last two years, everything has been crashing down again and discounts have widened and the whole industry is uh, looking at its navel and asking whether this is a, you know, a terminal crisis or not. But just in terms of what's happened to the investment trust world since April the 6th, 2020, Simon, you always have a number to hand. Do you have a number to hand that you could share with us about how the investment trust sector has performed since then? Well, you know, I like some numbers. Uh, It's very much my bread and butter. But since the 6th of April, 2022, the 28th of February, the sector is up about 48, 49%. And that's actually behind the UK market in the form of the FTSE All Share, which has risen about 60%. But it's really been to use that hackneyed cliche, a game of two halves. So actually, if you look at the period from the 6th of April to the end of 2021, that was an incredibly strong period for investment trusts. 
Obviously, it had the benefit of discounts narrowing from the point that we started the Moneymakers podcast. I think the sector was up about 71% to the end of 21, and that compared with a rise of 50% for the wider UK market in the form of the all share. It's been a really different story since the start of 2022. The sector in the form of the FTSE all share closed end investments index down about 13% or so. And that compares with a rise for the UK market in the form of the FTSE all share up just over 6%. So a difficult last few years. So I might bring you in here, Mark, as well. And I just want to start by putting you on the spot by saying you became a non-executive director of two or three investment trusts and you were thrown straight into the fire, essentially, weren't you? Because that was quite recently. You took those jobs on and uh, you've been kind of fighting fires ever since. Well, we all have been fighting fires. I would love to be on a board where there's no problems. (laughs) It would be really nice. I'm looking forward to listening to another Ned saying it's marvellous, but all I've had is, is anything but problems. We closed the Jupiter Fund down entirely. We merged the Invesco one into another Invesco. And of course, right now we're just undergoing a a change in the Invesco Select in trying to bring it into one mandate, i.e. a global income fund under Steve Ennis. So it's been pretty busy. We can call you sort of the Conan the Destroyer of the Investment Trust (laughs) Secretary. Well, not deliberately. (laughs) (laughs) But I think that just puts a finger on one of the real issues, which is Given what's happened the last two years anyway, and we've seen this huge uh, derating across most sectors, a lot of sectors anyway, particularly the alternatives, your trusts are all in the conventional equity uh, space, but there's been inevitable consolidation. I mean, basically, we have to say we've seen that, it's continuing, and there's a good reason for it, of course. Well, I think we'll see a lot more, actually, particularly in the UK. I mean, the UK market, as I think Simon said, has been not a favourite. It hasn't been a favourite since about 2015 or 16, probably since Brexit. And it's continued to be very poor against, I suppose, a very strong background in the US. And in fact, it reminds me a little bit of the 1980s, when, in the beginning of the 80s when I first started, because the first holding I ever had was a, a Japanese unit trust. And that was the big market to be in in the 1980s. But the last 10, 15 years, it's definitely been the US. And that's just taking the spoils everywhere. It's not actually just the UK. Emerging markets have been spectacularly poor. I suppose Japan's the only market that's actually ironically picked up in the last year or so. And then we have, which I'm sure we'll talk about, all these alternative investment trusts which have come into the scene, I think, in the last two or three years in particular, I think, very strongly. Indeed. And Simon, of course, I think we've always said that the investment trust industry by its nature is cyclical, but this has been kind of more cyclical than you would normally see it. Let's put it that way, shall we? Yeah, I mean... (laughs) I think that's true to a point. I mean, you're right, the investment trust sector is certainly cyclical in nature. And I mean, when I started getting involved in the sector, so that's 22, 23 years ago, now investment trusts were described to me as great bull market products that essentially they were all kind of long only equity funds at that time. And that when market conditions were in their favour, they benefited from gearing, discounts narrowing. But also the reverse was true as well. And certainly well-informed investors would play investment trusts on that basis. Obviously, the sector has changed in the intervening period to the point there are now far more, probably about half the sector, frankly, in alternative asset classes. But there is still that cyclical element to it. I mean, again, you look over the last 30 years, we've seen a real boom time for the investment trust sector, probably in the 90s, on the back of the single stock PEPs. Some people listening to your podcast, I'm sure, remember those and a number of investment trusts were launched to kind of tap into that. We also had the tech boom at the end of that decade. We saw a number of investment trusts launched to take advantage of that. A few are still with us. And then even in the noughties, a large number of fund of hedge funds, which ultimately all came a cropper during the GFC, went out to big discounts, were ultimately wind up. So the investment trust sector does ebb and flow. There are certain names that have obviously been with us an awfully long time, but equally there are names that come and go. And, uh, of course, in the 90s, we also had all that uh, spate of single country trust as well, which suddenly became a kind of in vogue thing to do. So, but of course, that's true of of open-ended funds as well. We've had all sorts of different cycles in open-ended funds. I guess it's fair to say, Mark, that most of your experience and your personal investments have been in open-ended funds. So we always say about investment trusts, well, you know, over the long haul, they do slightly better than uh, open-ended equivalents. But of course, there's a price you pay for that, which is perhaps a greater volatility in the short term. And and I guess it's a question of really who are investment trusts suitable for? We always say the discerning investor, meaning someone who understands <laughs> that actually they can be very cyclical. What would be your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I don't disagree. I mean, yes, I suppose when I first started, it was very much the open-ended space. 
Investment trusts, I mean, I love the ebb and flow because I think Simon's exactly right on that. But actually, I think they've gathered strength over the last 20 years or so. And I think they've been helped enormously by the AIC. Because as much as I like to argue with you chaps a lot of the time, I think the AIC as a trade body has done a fantastic job in promoting investment trusts. And I might add that the opposite end of the spectrum, the IA on the open end, it have done nothing, as far as I can tell. They've done an absolutely awful job. In fact, I'd love to poach the entire AIC staff and put them over to open-ended because it needs a bit of a champion, I think, whereas investment trusts needed their champion 20, 25 years ago. And I think they've been strong ever since. I guess as a commentator, and perhaps because I started as an IFA anyway, I like to think I'm independent. And so I view investment trusts as not quite the religious experiences I read about sometimes, but rather I look at the cons as much as the pros. And I'd have to say the media and the AIC I probably have done a great job here. Just don't look at ever the cons. And one of the great things is open-ended investments. They always tell me, well, they're open-ended, so that's always a problem. But I can't help but think that the investment trust world spends most of its time trying to open-end itself because of discounts. There's continuation votes. There's all sorts of mergers. And actually, so many investors seem to be desperate to get out at net asset value. So there are extraordinary contradictions, can I say, in the investment trust world, which is seldom talked about. Well, I hear what you say. And I I think this is one of the few places I think I would say the podcast, where we do actually acknowledge that there are some negatives around the investment trust (laughs) sector, and they do materialise at different times. And and governance, we might come back onto governance in a moment. Of course, and talking about the AOC, they have done a fantastic job. I mean, that could all change now, because Simon's recently been elected to the council. uh, So so he's going to be involved in running it. So that's, you missed the chance to poach him for the IA. But let's be uh, realistic about this a little bit. One of the advantages of investment trusts is said to be, and I think genuinely is in a number of cases, I'll ask Simon to comment this, is the corporate governance. Now, in the old days, the very old days of investment trusts, that wasn't necessarily the case. But more recently, it has become much stronger governance, I think. And one of the problems with the open-ended industry is, of course, the incentives are very different there. And that's why you've had hundreds of funds which carry on well beyond their sell-by date. They aren't shut down because they don't have a board that basically shuts them down. Uh, they are now being shut down because the FCA has introduced this consumer duty and suddenly they've got to prove that they're value for money when quite often they're not. So that's one way in which the investment trust sector sort of distinguishes itself from the open-ended sector is by having and doing this kind of winding up on periodic uh, basis. Uh, you would agree with that, I think, Simon? Absolutely. One of the aspects, important aspects of the role I now perform at JP Morgan Asset Management is dealing with non-executive directors. That's very much my day job. I mean, we've got nearly 100 non-executive directors across our stable of 18 investment trusts. And it is very, very clear to me that their responsibility is primarily to their shareholders. It's not to JP Morgan Asset Management or any other provider who they happen to be dealing with. And they are challenging, absolutely challenging in, in a very positive way. And I have thought for a long, long time, it is, to your point, one of the key advantages of the investment trust structure. I think there are a number of others as well. But that for me is very, very important, especially in this day and age. And I think the quality of a board becomes very obvious at times when issues arise and how those board members, how those directors address and react to those issues. That's when you find out how good your board is. Right. And that plays into what you were saying, Mark, and indeed what you've been having to do as a non-executive director. You're not sitting there just saying, very nice job. Yeah. You know, thank you very much for the lunch and all the rest of it. But uh, you are actually taking it seriously. Now, I mean, we don't want you to reveal the secrets of the boardroom, but <laughs> how quickly did that incentive, as it were, or the requirement to do something about the future of your particular trust, I mean, how, did, how quickly did that manifest itself when you well, joined the boards? I think pretty quickly, because I think I probably helped manifest it myself. As Simon says, you are there on behalf of the shareholders and you've got to get to work fairly quickly. The process could be a bit slow still because you're not a full-time executive. So having come from a company like Hargreaves Lansdowne and going onto a board where you're just a non-executive is slightly slower, but you do have to act. And the idea that it's just, I think 30 years ago, it was one of those retirement type jobs that you just sort of fell into and didn't have to do very much. Well, that has completely changed. And I have to say, the fellow non-execs that I've worked with have been absolutely first rate. Gosh, they are really, really good and they really care. It doesn't always mean you make the right decisions, but I can't fault anyone for not caring about what they're doing and trying to do the best. And the idea that they're in love with the company 
in terms of the management company in Invesco or Jupiter or whatever it be is far from the truth. I think they strive for their independence. I can tell you, having had a few arguments before now, it's very, very obvious to me. So I do think that is a great side of investment trusts, which you don't get on open-ended funds. Mind you, it doesn't always mean that it always works out well. I'm kind of thinking of the things that have gone wrong in the last couple of years. There's quite a list of investment trusts like Song, like, well, Home REIT's still suspended. You've got a list of funds which have not only not performed well, but you'd have to question governance. I mean, particularly on Song, I have no idea trying to catch up with what's going on there. And very hard for a retail client or retail investor to stay abreast of all this, by the way. That's where I sometimes think your particular podcast is excellent, but I still think the flow coming from investment trusts is not as good as it could be. Maybe that's because brokers aren't allowed under MIFID 2 to send any notes to private clients either, which I always find one of those strange things. So I know from when I was at HL, there's lots of good information out there, but it's denied to many of the retail clients, which I find completely at odds with transparency and clarity, really. What do you say about that, Simon? What were your reflections on that? Well, Mark is correct. I mean, obviously, I'm out of the research game these days, but I know back when I was involved actually interacting with retail investors, providing them with any form of research was a complete no-go for compliance and regulation reasons. So that is a difficult area. That said, certainly my old guys, we were very happy. And to be fair, a number of analysts, including the team at Winterfeld, are still very happy to interact with journalists, with media, and try and express their views. And I think there are a number of excellent journalists covering the sector who invariably are good at kind of capturing what analysts are saying And so that does kind of get fed out into the media. But you're right, there is a kind of block there in terms of sell-side analysts interacting with retail investors. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the issues that have been raised by the performance investment trusts over the last couple of years. This big derating accompanied by, and to some extent caused by, the uh, rise in interest rates. But there are some other fundamental problems, aren't there, around the investment trust sector. And one of the biggest ones is around liquidity. One of the reasons why we've seen this big derating is that there aren't enough buyers and there's still some sellers out there. And so it's actually quite difficult. And in some cases, very difficult to get a quote. So at the same time, the investment trust sector has been saying, well, we really need to get private investors involved in this because it's a very good vehicle for them. It's been a difficult time to be a private investor in investment trusts. And in particular, as Mark says, if you don't understand exactly how they work and you can't get access to good commentary and good information. But there is this problem with a lot of institutions and wealth managers no longer investing in the same way in investment trusts. They were always the big uh, supporters in the past. Would you say that's a, a fundamental structural problem, Simon, or is it just part of this whole cyclical phase that we're going through? Well, I mean, definitely there is a cyclical element to this. I mean, when you talk about the shareholders, the different shareholder elements of the shareholder base, in general, there has been a gentle retreat by wealth managers from investment trusts for a number of years, particularly for kind of long-only equity funds. There are exceptions to that. So in the last few weeks, you may have noticed that uh, JP Morgan Global Growth and Income announced a placing, and that was very much in response to a large wealth manager who was looking for an efficient way into that particular investment trust. So you mean that's certainly one of the larger ones in our stable, and it has performed very well. So you can understand why that would have been of interest for them. But in general, the trend of wealth managers has been away from those kind of more plain vanilla type investment trusts, where there has been traction amongst wealth managers and particularly multi-asset investors has been in the more alternative vehicles over a number of years. Obviously, that's gone into retreat the last few years. And there are a number of reasons for that. I think probably the changing environment in terms of interest rates is probably the key factor there, that offering yields of 5 to 6% in alternative asset classes no longer has the same kind of traction than it did before we saw that rapid increase in interest rates. So there has been a scramble for the door as people have looked to, frankly, investing in bonds or gilts as an alternative form. So it's the classic, there's more sellers than buyers. And that's, I think, been a kind of key factor in leading the derating. But I think boards are responding to this. I think they recognise this. I mean, if you look at the stats in terms of the amount of capital that has been returned across the sector, I mean, the number I've got in front of me was at 3.9 billion returned last year according to my friends at Winterflood, just through buybacks alone. And that was up 44% year on year. And that's the highest annual level since buybacks became tax efficient in the late 1990s. In addition to that, you had the best part of a billion pounds returned through tender offers and redemptions. So the result of all that is that we actually saw net outflow of capital of about three and a half billion for the investment company sector last year. So there is this contraction going on as the point that we made earlier. It's boards being proactive, taking action, 
and looking to take measures to, if not narrow their discounts, at least put a, a line below them. So in other words, not allow them to go out any wider. Yeah. I mean, that would be one of the points I think you would make as well, Mark. But I mean, it's not as if open-ended funds aren't experiencing big redemptions as well. It's just that it has a negative impact in a different way from it does in, with an investment trust. Yes. It doesn't hit the share price. It just tends to hurt the performance of the fund. Yeah, sorry, that's perfectly true. I'd actually say if there's a wider point to be made in that the asset management industry is undergoing, well, I would say a big change. And the big change isn't investment trusts. It isn't open-ended funds. It's passive. You only had to see the results for Aberdeen yesterday and see the share price of companies like Jupiter just to see the pressure that they are under. And that does include investment trusts that they're ultimately as well, that passive is just sinking everyone. Because if you look at passive performance over the last 10 to 15 years, it is extremely strong and the prices have kept falling. Whereas I can't say that is entirely true elsewhere. And so people have been voting more and more with their feet. And I think it's a huge challenge to the asset management industry, which I'd have to say, in my view, has been somewhat decadent about the whole thing in the past. And I think salaries have been way, way too high and they're going to have to cut margins way down. I think one of the arguments I have sometimes against the investment trust side is they have some great product, but I looked at one the other day, I think CC Japan, which is one of the top performers over five years. I'm a holder of that. I thought I'd go and buy some more about six months ago and discovered that I could get in, but the spread was over 5%. It kind of reminded me of the old days of unit trust when I started, when there was a 5% initial charge. So there's a problem of liquidity everywhere, but the problem's also big in investment trust, and it's not talked about nearly enough. I should be able to market the best Japan fund without any problem, but how can I face an investor and say, well, it's going to cost you 5% to get in or out? It's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Well, I had a similar experience the other day. I was trying to sell some shares in, a, in an investment trust, which has a market cap around 100 million. And I couldn't get a yeah. quote for 5,000, even from your yeah. illustrious employers. Uh, they just wouldn't yeah. do it. So, it's, so back to trading by appointment, as we used to say. Simon, what are your comments? I mean, as a former broker, are you obviously uh, very familiar with the issues that the brokers are facing at the moment? I mean, some of them are, are struggling, aren't they? I mean, there's not enough business out there on normal sort of day-to-day -day trading anyway, in, in investment trusts in particular. Obviously, I talk to brokers all the time and you get the sense that clearly it has been a difficult period, but maybe things are just picking up a little that we're seeing trading volumes certainly higher than they have been. But, you know, just picking up this point on passive, I think it's a really interesting one. And is it bad for asset managers or is it an opportunity? And I think we'd get JP Morgan, we're probably in the latter camp, to be honest. And I think what probably most people would agree on that it's probably good for investors that beta, to use that hackneyed expression, is actually cheap. It is incredibly cheap at the moment. I mean, if you just want market exposure through an ETF, then you don't have to pay an awful lot for it. So from that point of view, I think what it means is that when you come to active management, which invariably where investment trusts are, you have to prove that you can actually, if not over every given time period, certainly over the long term, do something more than the benchmark. In other words, outperform over the longer term. So I think it is a challenge for active management. But I think it's a good challenge, to be perfectly honest. And do ETFs or passive funds, do they bring fees down overall? Yes, I think they probably do. And again, I don't, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for investors, to be perfectly honest. No, I quite agree. I think the most important thing is to get investors actually investing, <laughs> be it wherever. I'm a fan of active. I'm a fan of anything that gets investors actually into the stock market. And from there, they can go to other things as well. So that's all good. What I actually don't like is what I'm, I suppose I've been doing a bit myself now is arguing over what is good or bad about different trusts. I do get a little bit cross about the investment trust industry spent a lot of time, it seems to me, having a go at the open-ended funds, whereas I just don't think that's terribly helpful, particularly as on platforms, open-ended funds basically subsidise all the investment trusts. So I just don't think those arguments are great for the industry as a whole. So I, I welcome passive. I remember Peter Hargreaves welcoming good old Virgin coming in. And, and I remember Newsnight asked him to come on and, and argue against Branson. And he said, no, I wouldn't argue. I'm going to welcome him in because he's going to increase the pie. And of course, he wasn't on Newsnight because of that. It says much about the media as well. They like a good argument. <laughs> well, that's very true. Um, so I guess the question then is, or one question anyway, is, is this a good time to be investing in investment trusts? Is it a good time to be investing in active management? 
perhaps you could ask that question first. Is it a good time to be investing in active management? Is it a good time to be investing in investment trusts, which are the best ones are good active managers. The less good ones are not. They don't beat passives, the less good ones. So do you think there are parallels between the year 2000 and this year? I mean, I remember Anthony Bolton, the great Fidelity stock picker, ringing me up in excitement to say that he was actually really excited by the TMT crash because it meant finally there were lots of opportunities. All these stocks had been neglected during the bubble were suddenly available on very attractive valuations. Do you see a parallel between then and now, Mark? Well, I think it was different because in 2000, technology didn't make any money. But today, they are making money and they've become very big. And actually, going back to the active debate, I'd be interested to hear what Simon says, is that the reinforcement of trackers all the time, of of passive, increases those big companies all the time. But they are making huge amounts of money. And that was completely different back in 2000. Uh, you know, history rhymes. I don't think it's completely the same today. And I suppose one of the things that's happening is the bigger companies are just getting bigger and smaller companies. If you look at US smaller companies, UK smaller companies, anything like this is all out of vogue. That's usually quite a good time to buy, is it not? Unfashionable, you know, uh, unwanted is usually the best time. And, And investment trusts are good at that because they signal it by having a large discount. So... I would have suggested yeah. that might be a good time to be buying. I just have to think you have to be a bit select about what you're buying, but I would say that's not a bad time to do it. But I think it's going to go on for a lot longer. These larger stocks are going to carry on getting bigger at the present time. I don't see that finishing completely, but whole swathes of the markets are actually quite cheap as far as I can see. Indeed they are, and I'm sure you'd agree with that, Simon. It is true that some of these uh, big tech companies in particular are making lots of money, lots of money for the moment. Yeah, that is certainly true. But they're also trading on some very high multiples as well. What do you think about the parallels of 2000, Simon? Mark makes a good point about history tends to uh, maybe not repeat, but certainly kind of rhyme. I mean, look, the market is very concentrated at the moment, what's driven the market. I mean, there's some incredible stats around what actually drove the US market in the form of the S&P 500 last year, a very small handful of stocks. And I know in podcasts in, in recent months, you've talked a lot about the Magnificent Seven, and people are now looking beyond those names. That's not to say that anything necessarily unfortunate will happen to those seven names. I mean, they are all incredible companies and you know making money to a greater or lesser extent. But I think where active management comes into its own, it's where there is market inefficiencies. And again, to Mark's point, it feels that that's where we are at the moment. So when I talk to some of the portfolio managers here, what's making them very exciting is that kind of disconnect between the kind of well-known highly rated kind of companies within their peer group, particularly say on the US or the global side, and those opportunities that they're seeing elsewhere. So if you talk to someone like Helgi Scabelli, who works alongside Tim Woodhouse and James Cook on the Global Growth and Income Fund, that's very much what they're looking to do. They're looking to kind of tap into, they'll hold some of those, I think they've got four of the Magnificent Seven in their portfolio at the moment, but they're looking to tap into some of those other names that perhaps the market isn't entirely focused on at the moment, where they believe there's actually quite an interesting valuation opportunity there. But Jonathan, it's interesting, you see, because we're now talking about what I would call the traditional market here. And one of my points to you a while ago was on the alternatives, on some of the alternatives. I think investment trusts have strayed into what I call operating businesses or what I call single themes as well. In my day, if it was a unit trust, I would have called it a sex and violence fund, mainly because they were single theme funds. And usually the retail client ended up with the violence and very little of the sex. And I can't help but think that some of the alternatives are proving to be exactly that. The reason I say it is that, talking with Simon now, we're talking about stocks, but the real problems have come from some of these alternatives like space, we've got Digital Nine, we've had Song, and more recently, battery technology. And these are really quite complicated vehicles. And in fact, I think you don't need a Peter Spiller. You need someone who actually understands the wind industry, which is actually an an energy policy in the UK, which is, I have to say, incredibly complicated. I have spent about 18 months reading reports on batteries, on wind technology. And I have to say that most of it is not that favourable, but it's highly politicised. So it's not talked about much in the media. And indeed, one journalist said to me, oh, well, I won't get anything past my editor if I talk about anything anti-ESG or anti-wind turbines, Mark. It's just not on. And, and I think that's a debate that the industry needs to have. And, and indeed, 
on your Money Makers podcast, maybe you need an expert from that side of the industry who is actually not involved in investment trust, but is actually involved in the industry. I think that's a fair point. These are complicated industries, some of them. Just talking about the alternatives, there is in a general thing. We know they've been affected by what's happened to interest rates. That's obviously one of the driving factors. But there's also a quite an interesting distinction between the ones that came out originally and the ones more recently that came yes. to the market. And that sort of tends to be what happens, doesn't it? When you get something that seems to be working, then you get lots of follow-on things, and they're not as good as the original ones for obvious reasons. And maybe that's, you know, if you contrast the performance of some of the ones that have been around for 10 years against those that only came to the market last two or three years, it's a very marked difference between the two. I mean, I did some numbers, and I'm going to put them in the email this week, about the performance of some of the longer-running alternatives in the infrastructure space, Greencoat UK Wind and Bluefield Solar, people like that. I mean, their returns are actually pretty good. They stack up pretty well. Well, even now, despite them going to big discounts, they're still done better than the average UK equity income fund. They've done better than the gilts, and they've done it with lower volatility. So they've actually delivered a positive real return over the last 10 years since they actually came to market. But some of the later stuff, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. They're newer, therefore they're riskier. Some of them are just, as you say, they're operating businesses, which people don't perhaps understand. They like the excitement of music royalties or space or whatever it might be. And it takes time for the market to actually work out whether these things are actually viable or not. And in a higher interest rate environment, some of them have too much debt and so on. Uh, Yeah, there are going to be lots of problems around that. But again, going back to this cyclical pattern in investment trusts, when we get new trusts coming to the market, you do tend to get some things that don't work as well as some things that do work, don't you, Simon? I think that's right. I think that's the pattern that we've seen over any number of decades. And look, it's a disappointment, obviously, when vehicles don't work out. Um, and sometimes it's a problem of the asset class, but quite often it might be a problem of the management involved. It might be a problem with the balance sheet. There was too high a level of gearing, for instance. Uh, a number of the companies that have been mentioned, investment companies that have been mentioned, are probably overgeared at the wrong point. But yes, it's disappointing. And it does take some time to work these things through, particularly given the nature of the asset class as well. I mean, if an equity fund doesn't work out, then ordinarily it's relatively straightforward to kind of move it on, change the manager, liquidate it, or whatever it needs to be done. With these particular investment companies, it could take a number of years. And in fact, a number are in managed wind down, but it will take some time for investors to get their money back. Yeah, some of the debt ones, for example, they say it could take seven years to get your money back, which is, of course, problematic when you're trying to persuade people uh, that it's still worth hanging on to them. But I would make just one supplementary point. I mentioned about the fund of hedge funds. And again, they were quite complicated products. I mean, they were sold into wealth managers in, in the noughties. And unfortunately, the GFC was pretty unkind to them. And all of them, I think, were wound up. But there were still people and professional investors, value oriented investors, who were quite prepared to play those names were prepared to do the homework and understand the exposures and really hold those things through to redemption, i.e. the point where they got their money back. And even though it took a number of years, they were happy to be part of that journey on the basis of the knowledge that they'd gleaned about them. So that's not to say that all the alternatives that have been mentioned will be good value plays, but you mentioned Mr. Spiller earlier, and I think there are other kind of more value oriented investors in in the sector, people such as uh, Nick Greenwood and even old uh, Mr. Peter Hewitt, who... I know features on your podcast. I mean, for people who are prepared to do their homework, prepared to take a longer term view, I think there's probably some money to be made out of a number of these names. But I think you have to be quite careful as you go. Yeah, I think one of the other issues, and I think Mark alluded to this earlier on, which is how investment trusts are presented in the media and also by those who are promoting them. We spend an awful lot of time talking about discounts, when actually those of us who have all been around a long time, we know that actually most of the things that uh, deliver the returns for us are actually things we've held for a long time, and we hold them for the longer term, and we actually rather ignore the discounts. The discounts can create wonderful opportunities, they can create additional risks, and there are obviously professionals who can make money out of trading in and out of these things. But do you think there's a case that actually the investment trust industry overplays the importance of discounts? It's always, you know, here's your chance to buy something worth a pound for 90 that kind of argument. Do you actually think that uh, that's rather overdone? No, I've always thought that was a a great argument for buying. It's just the the contradiction comes particularly maybe 18 months ago when most stuff was at a premium. And I was reading media articles that said, well, buy grid, buy some of these things. This is where I get quite cross because why would you buy something at a premium? It's absolutely brilliant idea to buy something at a 20% discount if you think that's going to change. But to actually overpay for an asset, and this comes from a media that's normally spending most of its time 
uh, having a go at financial services for costing too much, yet he's actually promoting funds on 5 to 10% premiums. The one thing I always know about an investment trust is that it can stay on a premium for a while, but it won't stay there forever. And it's extremely painful when something goes from a 10% premium to a 20% discount. And I think there is an educational process. You know, the other strange thing or contradiction with investment trusts is that you can really only expand them when they are trading at a premium. So the boards tap out issues, obviously, when it's at a premium, but that's when it's most expensive. So the whole thing is slightly odd, is what I'd like to say. But I don't think this is ever particularly explained to the retail investor very well. And it certainly isn't in the media, in my view. I think just picking up on that, back in my days as an analyst, one of the things that we always looked at was the kind of downside discount risk. Because it's one of the, I mean, we talk about the advantage of the investment company's structure. The key disadvantage is the discount risk. The idea that your share price in NAV performance might be entirely different in a number of different ways. So to understand that risk, so obviously with the more alternative asset classes, that by definition have more illiquid underlying portfolios, it means it's quite difficult to pursue any kind of discount target or without realising some of their assets, pursue a buyback programme or a tender. It's just more difficult to move around. So a classic would be commercial property, for instance, which is, you know, if you will, an alternative asset class, but it's one that's been around for a long time, certainly the years, all the years pretty much I've been covering investment companies. Whereas if you look at some of the more mainstream, long only plain vanilla, if you will, Uh, investment trusts. Some of them do have pretty much hard and fast discount targets. And I know you've featured on podcasts past some names such as Capital Gearing Trust, Personal Assets, and other such names that have pursued a zero discount policy. And invariably, with some success, Capital Gearing's short-term problems aside. So I think it can be done. But I think the point is, again, for investors in investment companies, just to have some kind of idea of what is the potential downside discount risk, because it is obviously a key part of the investment company structure. So would it be fair to say, Mark, that if you join your boards three years earlier, some of them might have been trading at a premium. That I don't think they were actually, but they might have been. Would you have been saying we must reduce the premium? Yes, I would. Yeah. Having a big premium is no good to you either. But it's the frustration, slightly the frustration part of it is that you actually want to increase the funds under management to increase the liquidity, but you're having to do it at a strange time, really. And as I said, everything's now at a discount. So the only chance of actually increasing is probably you end up merging or you end up giving the money back to shareholders in the end, which if that's right for shareholders, then that's the right thing to do. But it's all a little bit frustrating as a board sometimes because you you actually want to move things on and you actually want the investment trust to grow and move forward, not to go backwards. But a bit like open-ended funds, there's too many investment trusts. And I think Peter Spiller used to say at least two thirds needed to go. It was always quite forthright in what he said. <laughs> but there does need to be a cut down and we can see it in alternatives now. But I, there's an opportunity there. There's some wonderful opportunities there right now. But and now nobody wants to talk about it apart from yourselves. And, and this is exactly the time to be coming out to talk about what's on offer because there does seem to be some potential bargains. And I don't think interest rates are going to stay high for a long time. I'm much more a dove on interest rates. I think they'll be falling. And so that opens up the reverse opportunity that we've had in the last year or so, where I could see a considerable re-rating on some of these trusts. Indeed, I think we all might share that opinion, but you can't obviously determine the timing. And that's notwithstanding these issues around cost disclosure and liquidity and all the rest of it, some of which will persist, I think. So what I was going to say was, perhaps looking forward on a more positive note, I mean, one of the concerns I have is that we're not seeing any IPOs. We're not seeing the next generation of investment trusts coming along. And it's obviously very difficult when everything, or nearly everything is trading at a discount. It's actually very difficult to persuade the brokers to launch a new trust. I was very struck by the manager of Ashoka India, who said that basically the reason they'd actually launched their recent emerging market trust, even though it only raised 30 million, was that they were in it for the long haul and they'd seen lots of other trusts which started very small, put in some good performance, and then the Rolling Stone gathers moss kind of thing actually grew from very small starts. Whereas, of course, if you go to the brokers or people like that, they say, well, if you're only going to get 30 million, it's not worth doing. So how do we resolve that uh, conundrum, Simon? What would your colleagues back at uh, Winterflood say about that? Well, look, I don't think the IPO window is going to open any time soon, unfortunately. I mean, who knows by the end of this year, but at the moment, it still feels some way off. But look, it's very easy to get 
despondent about investment companies where they are today. But I think as we probably touched on throughout this conversation, there are any number of advantages of the structure and they don't go away. I firmly believe there is a a future for investment trusts. I mean, you've talked before, I think, about the kind of greater dividend certainty that the structure provides. We talk about the access to less liquid asset classes. Now, whether people want those less liquid asset classes today is a moot point. But I think over the longer term, you could see that still being the case. And I think, and possibly one of the most important aspects, if you talk to a portfolio manager who's involved in an investment trust and the equivalent open-ended fund, they'll often express a preference for the investment trust. And I'm going to say this you know, softly in the walls of JP Morgan, but they will talk about the advantage that it brings them in terms of making longer-term investment decision-making and the ability to invest in some less liquid names. And I think it's those advantages that do work over the long term. To your earlier point, it is about long-term investment. And I think that's why they do sit well potentially with retail investors. And certainly that's been our experience here that we have seen quite a significant uptick in retail investors using platforms such as Hargreaves. Other platforms are available, I should say. <laughs> but that, that's certainly been a very much a long-term trend of our platform here. It's quite striking if you look at the historical figures, you know, how many investment trusts we talk about, of the many that there were back 20 years ago, how many are still around today? It's a fairly small percentage. It's only, I think, 25% or something ridiculous like that, which means that the sector has to renew, but that's its great strength. It does renew. So I'm going to finish then by asking you both. So today, I don't know exactly how many investment trusts are there, probably about 350 or something like that. How many do you think there'll be in four years' time when we record the 400th episode of the podcast? <laughs> if we're all still here, that is. And do you think it'll look very different? The makeup of the sector will look very different then? We're speculating, yes. So feel free to fantasize. Well, I think there'll be fewer because I think there needs to be fewer to increase the liquidity of those that are around. And I think, I won't go off the complete tangent, but I think there needs to be a way to be able to work with platforms. For retail clients, platforms have been the way forward for buying. All my purchases are obviously on one platform, but the platforms themselves have real problems because they're not allowed to take any money. Apart from actually buying, there's no brokerage fee. And I can remember I was asked to do lots of deals after we had the commission agreement and we couldn't do it. We could do lots of work and get paid nothing for it. It was very frustrating and our platforms could be in a great position to help boards gather assets and help them through discount times, all the bad times, but they're not really there because the regulations don't let it work. A bit like the cost disclosures stuff that's gone through. We're missing out on a huge part of the industry. Platforms aren't really allowed to work with investment trusts in the way they should be allowed to. Well, that's an interesting issue. And I think, Simon, perhaps you want to finish by commenting on that and where you think we'll be in four years' time. I mean, we might come back to that issue, Mark, because I think that's a very interesting point you're making there. I think it is. And I think it's quite a big issue. Probably it deserves more than a kind of 30-second soundbite, but it's certainly something to think about. I mean, look, what are we going to see over the next four years? We're going to see contraction. We're going to see a reduction in the number of names. Could it fall below 300? I think that's entirely possible. But I like to think we'd see within that time period some more names appearing but I think they're going to be a relatively small number. I think we're going to see consolidation for the reasons that Mark touched on. I think there are still too many small investment trusts whose performance records probably need addressing. But I think there are kind of two key drivers that we shouldn't lose sight of, that every time an investment trust mandate comes up for grabs, you know, we see a strategic review announced, a beauty parade, the number of inbound inquiries that come from different asset managers is always considerable. There is a real interest in running investment trust companies from a variety of houses. And I think that tells you something about the nature of the vehicles. But I think ultimately, the most important element is the investors. I still believe that investors and particularly retail, but even on the wealth manager side, I think if you can provide them with an investment trust that is large, has scale, has a very competitive cost ratio and can demonstrate that it can deliver long-term outperformance, I think there's absolutely interest there. And I think there are admittedly a small number of examples of just those kind of investment trusts around in the marketplace at the moment. Okay, so I guess one question I won't ask you, Simon, is whether or not in four years' time we'll still have hypnosis songs around to talk about. It doesn't look very likely at the moment to me, but you never know. You know, if Barry Manilow is still going at that point in four years' time, they, who knows? We might still see hypnosis songs sort of staggering along. So final question to you, Mark, same sort of thing, but uh, you own, still own some investment trusts. You're, you're busy 
<laughs> cutting a swathe through oh, the yeah. sector, but you still own some. And uh, are you available for hire if anybody wants to put their no, investment always, trust in? Always available, Jonathan. But yeah, I have quite a number, actually. I recently added to City of London, for example, but I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I mean, I do have some of the alternatives, but I haven't been wildly impressed with the way they've worked through. And when you look at something like City of London with its 56 dividend increases, it's rather nice. So things like Temple Bar in Edinburgh, because I'm an income person, because I'm getting on a bit. So I like those dividends. Uh, just Mark, I think you should probably be looking at some of the JP Morgan uh, investment trusts as well. Actually, I think it sounds an obvious gap in your in your portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, we couldn't end end without that. So I'd like to thank both my guests today. That's Mark Dampier, former head of research at Hargreaves London, and Simon Elliott, now a client director at JP Morgan Asset Management, and my original co-host on this podcast. And the reason why we ever got past uh, the first 100 episodes is entirely down to him and his willingness to come on every week and put me right on a few things. So thank you both. Just a quick reminder that if you want to see me or uh, Simon himself, that we are both appearing at the Master Investor Show next week in London on Saturday. And we're going to be there most of the day so i'm afraid there's no hiding place so if you've got things you want to talk about to us do come over and find us we'd be more than happy to talk to you thank you for listening the money makers weekly investment trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels you can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.